<laughs> Praise God. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter 11. The book of Judges, chapter 11. I want to talk about spiritual warriors this morning. The great um, British war hero, hero Winston Churchill, once remarked, there was nothing more exhilarating than to be shot at without result. And to read that comment, you realize how this guy could be a war hero. That there is something about this that moved him. And the truth of the matter is, this morning, as long as we live in an imperfect world, we are going to need warriors to defend us from evil. One of the biggest political errors of the last 10 years has been the peace dividend concept that we can close down all the bases now we can redirect all the re we don't need we don't need military anymore because after all the wall has fallen how many know that's that's quite a setup and so when we think about revival revival is also warfare in the Old Testament, warfare was synonymous with revival. You read the stories of the book of Judges. Every time God brought spiritual renewal to the Israelite people, they had a war. In the New Testament, of course, we know we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We know that, uh, that God's kingdom is, is not of this world, that it's a spiritual kingdom. But it, nevertheless, real revival is affected by warriors. And so I want to preach a message this morning that I've entitled The Parable of a Revival Warrior out of Judges chapter 11. I believe there is a powerful uh, uh, parallel in here to our fellowship and what God has done in us. Judges chapter 11, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman, or the King James says a strange woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. Some time later, when the Ammonites made war on Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of, to the land of Tob. They said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites and you will be our head over all who live in Gilead. I want to begin this morning by talking about some stands that Jephthah made that made him a powerful warrior. Number one, I want to talk how Jephthah withstood the assault against his legitimacy. Jesus told, preached right off the bat in his first experience that a prophet is without honor in his own town. And there is more to this than simply his experience in Nazareth when he began his ministry. What he is talking about, if you are going to do something for God, one of the first battles you are going to face when God begins to use you and lift you up is whether or not you are legitimate. And so even though God had his hand on Jephthah, had a great destiny, this was a terrible assault that came upon his life. And what made it worse, it was, almost, it was a half-truth. And so the devil loves to capitalize on the fact that God says, not many wise, not many noble, etc. He raises us up and the devil will come in immediately and say, you are illegitimate, you do not have a place, what you are doing is not right. It's a terrible assault. This is the path that all the God's freedom fighters have followed. How many know that? Moses, Exodus. He knows he's called of God. Moses tries to break up a fight between two fellow Israelites. And what do they tell him? They say, Moses, who made you ruler over us? In other words, they said, Moses, you didn't grow up in the body of Esa. What are you trying to say, man? You're not legitimate. You don't know what it's like. Gideon. He assaulted himself. 
when the angel of the Lord came to him, what did Gideon say? Gideon said, I'm the least in my father's house. My father's house is the least. And he said, I'm not legit. This is something I can't. He kind of had the Woody Allen syndrome. Woody Allen's the guy that said, I will not belong to any club that will have me as a member. And there's a lot of people that go through life assaulting their own legitimacy. Always. I believe a lot of people that eventually cave into this assault are people who have a problem with self-loathing. They take it to heart and they are actually beating the devil to the punch constantly questioning whether they're legitimate or not and what they're doing. This is a wicked assault. The disciples, they are ignorant and unlearned men. Paul, he called himself one born out of due season. I believe when Paul said that, he was being facetious. Because he had constantly been accused by his adversaries of being illegitimate. Not real. And so he says, I'm one born out of two se due season. I'm the, you know what, you call me. And then of course Jesus. When, it, when his testimony before the Pharisees got too hot and heavy in John chapter 8, what did they say? They said, we be not born of fornication. You are illegitimate. And so this assault just continually bombards the people of God and those that will go forth with the Word of God. Now, the modern illegitimacy slur, how many know, is the word cult. This is the word that the devil has concocted to strike the heart of a new ministry, to intimidate you and to overwhelm you. Now, the Bible does warn us against false teachers. And it's something that people, you know, need to think about. Matthew 24, Jesus did say many will come and deceive many. Now, let me just say this. This deceive many part acquits most of us pioneer pastors right off the bat. You know what I mean? In other words, if you looked at my attendance after last conference, I would have been, I would, you know, all charges would have been dismissed. But what I'm talking about is, is, is that there's a reality here. The Bible does, let me, if you're a new convert or, or, or a, a first time conference goer, just say, I want you to understand something. The Bible does speak to false teachers. Galatians, the Bible says that false teachers are cursed. You want to know what a cult is? Uh, in the biblical sense, it teaches false doctrine. It says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, 16, that there are false prophets. You know how you know a false prophet? A tree is known by its fruit. In other words, if the nursery attendants are doubling as the pastor's personal harem, that church has a problem. You know a tree by its fruit. It's not a matter of philosophy or ideas or approach. And also, one you very rarely hear from the religious world, also as a false prophet, is a man-pleaser. Jeremiah chapter 28 tells us about Hananiah, who was a false uh, prophet because he preached prosperity when God was speaking otherwise. And I'm telling you, the church has a major problem with that guy. But what I'm talking about is a demonic strategy against the church of Jesus Christ. In 1979, the devil levied one of his most powerful uh, uh, smart bombs against the church that has been levied in a long, long time when Jim Jones took a cult down to South America and had him drink Kool-Aid. Do you know, and I was reading Tom Wolf, he said before that episode, a cult was defined as a, an independent religious movement without political representation. But because of Jim Jones, the word cult became a, 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 a ready slur for anybody that wanted to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Anybody that wanted to preach consecration and repentance. And it's had a powerful effect. This strikes fear in the hearts of churches and preachers. It is a demonic slur. And just for the record, I live in San Francisco. Jim Jones' People's Temple was in San Francisco on Fillmore and, and Geary Street. Jim Jones was not a Pentecostal preacher. In fact, Jim Jones, and I'm not just saying this politically, this is a fact, you research it, please do, he was an operative of the local Democratic Party. He used to use his church members to pass out leaflets for leftist socialists running for office. In, in, in one account that I read, in 1977, get this, you want to see how this is so unlike a fellowship preacher, Jim Jones was honored at a star-studded event. 
gala affair with Hollywood, Hollywood actors and actresses, with many of the wealthy people of San Francisco, members of the Carter administration, gave Jim Jones a standing ovation as uh, the, the current mayor, Willie Brown, described him as being Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, and Mao Zedong rolled into one. This is not a preacher. This was not a Pentecostal that went m mad. This is not a guy that prayed for the sick too much and he lost it. This was a demonic plant to come against the revival of the 70s. And you need to understand that because the fact is, if you're going to preach in this generation, this bomb has already been exploded. And if you're going to preach and you're going to establish a church, friend, I have battled this myself. You must needs go through cult scaria. You've got to face the fact. The devil will put this slur in your face. And Jephthah was a man who learned how to stand up against this illegitimacy assault. And what was at stake here was inheritance. I don't think they had a problem with Jephthah staying at the palace as long as he was relegated to a second-class citizenship. I mean, just like the religious world. If you want to be a little sycophantic punk back in some major charismatic ministry, they might let you, you know what I mean, they might let you lead a, a Bible study somewhere where everybody has their own doctrine anyway. I knew a pastor that departed. He confided in me before he departed that he was going to try to pursue a, a place in a very popular Southern California ministry. And uh, I happened to run into him a few months after he departed, and I said, well, how did it go? And he looked at me and said, well, it's not what I thought. And I'll tell you what, this guy, that I, I'm not going to go into any other detail, this guy, bottom line, did not fit the surfer guy influence that this fellowship likes to promote. In other words, he took his inheritance and thinking that he would get one back at the palace. Friends, sometimes when the palace assaults your validity and your legitimacy, the only thing you can do is stand up and say, well, then I'll go elsewhere. Which brings me to my second point here. Jephthah not only withstood the illegitimacy assault, Jephthah stood apart from popular opinion. And I want to emphasize the word stood. He stood apart. There's a lot of people in life who live apart from popular opinion, but they don't stand apart from it. This is what really get, got me inspired about uh, our fellowship here. Because Jephthah came to the conclusion that acceptance with the palace, I will call them, was a futile pursuit. How many know that it's not a matter of just saying, uh, I'm going to be different and I'm, I'm going to be a separatist. You come to the conclusion that trying to find acceptance from popular religion is a, is a futile pursuit. How many know what I'm talking about? And it was in that place that Jephthah finally said, forget it. I'm going to stand apart. I remember the words of Brother Shambach years ago. He said, somebody, knew, somebody asked him, Brother Shambach, if I get saved, do I have to cut my friends loose? And Brother Shambach responded, no, because if you really get saved, your friends are going to cut you loose. <laughs> that's, part of, that's part of the issue right there. You get a crash course in holiness. And so here was Jephthah, and he made a powerful decision that he was going to have to base his life outside the camp of popularity. Tell you what, brother, that's when God will begin to help you and, and, and minister. Now, most of us know this. John the Baptist said in Matthew 11, uh, rather, Jesus speaking of John the Baptist, he said, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are kings or in palaces. He said, but what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, more than a prophet. This was Jephthah. He said, forget the popular scene. I'm going to just go out here and find my place. Now, Jephthah went to a place called Tob, T-O-B, Tob. Tob's an interesting word. It's important because the word Tob means good. And so there, there's a powerful word picture here. It's, it goes like this. A lot of people live their whole lives desperately 
seeking acceptance from the popular middle. A lot of people go through life accepting acceptance from their family. Wanting someone to uh, confer upon them some kind of legitimacy at all costs. But when Jephthah took a stand apart from popular culture, guess what he found? He found a good place from his acceptance. This tent we're in is a good place. There are major uh, uh, religious happenings all over the world. There are major uh, beautiful crystal cathedrals. There are how many? a lot of charismatic palaces out there where the brethren dwell, closely uh, uh, hoarding over their inheritance. But because we have taken a stand apart and said, we're going to serve God apart from this whole scene, God has given us a good place on the side of a mountain in Arizona. Place of blessing. See, a couple of tremendous things happened in Jephthah's life when he took a stand apart from popular opinion. Number one is, he found an identity. You know why our fellowship has such tremendous distinctives? Because we stand apart from popular Christianity. I'm not talking about responsibility to the church in, in, as a whole. I'm talking about standing apart from the pop culture where we are not sycophantic and seeking acceptance at every turn. And so it was in this place that you were able to establish some kind of identity. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Come out from among them, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will be your father. And there is something about stepping outside, and in that place, you are able to discern the will of God, you're able to get direction from God, and God is able to exercise His fatherhood over our lives. How many know when you're in the middle of popularity, uh, 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 all you are really concerned about is not pleasing God, but pleasing man? And so... Jephthah steps aside. The word holiness actually means to be set apart. That's, inter that's an interesting definition. You know why? Because what, it, what, what holiness really is saying is, you will not be righteous, you will not be ethical, you will not really uh, embrace goodness until you're set apart. Because as long as you think that you can contend in, 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 the, uh, you know, in the middle of pop culture, you'll never have any of those things. How many know the church world is always talking about the values of the kingdom of God, but has very little virtue? George Will wrote these words. He said, whenever you hear politicians speaking of values and not virtues, you are in the presence of America's problem, not its solution. And I want you to know, uh, and I'm not trying to be too judgmental here, but the fact of the matter is, where you get together with a lot of church conferences discussing family values, discussing uh, uh, all these, you know, uh, uh, even, you know, honorable things like, like uh, um, abstinence and so forth, and what you find there are people that are merely talking about values, but they do not have the consecration to convert those into virtues. The reason we have standards of holiness in our fellowship is because Pastor Mitchell has decided to stand apart from a lot of that stuff. And these people are filled with rhetoric, but they have very little personal power to actually live it out because holiness is set apart. That's what we learned these things by our experience. You know what used to just infuriate me back in New Mexico, Las Vegas, was that... Um, a lot of these people that wanted me to sign petitions, you know, to get the last temptation of Christ out of the theaters. Remember that one? I don't know what they're worried about in Las Vegas. It was never going to get there anyway. You know what I mean? But uh, they wanted, uh, you know, sign this petition. One time, a group of uh, Christian activists in town got infuriated with me because I refused to use our church to pass out leaflets for a pro-life Republican. And yet, what it, that's not what infuriated me. Let them ask, whatever. But the, what bothers me is that the same people, I know them. I know what churches they go to. They do not take stands against fornication. They do not deal with, with rebellion. They do not stand up to issues. They somehow want some, uh, uh, some uh, you know, elected official to do all the dirty work. But the Bible says judgment begins in the house of God. But they don't have the consecration to affect that. Well, my point is, the only reason we have this is because we've stood apart. You know, I know that Hillary teaches today that uh, takes the village people to raise a child, you know.
But, you know, God ordained the family to remove the child from the village. So you could tell your child, I don't care what the village is doing. This is what you're going to do. Because that's where identity comes from. It's insanity for people to think that they are going to find identity in some kind of popular Christian movement. Watching TBN, you know, going from one major evangelist, evangelistic event. In essence, they want to find a real identity in pop culture, friend. That is ridiculous. It's thinking that you can become black because you watch Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Or that you can be a Chicano because you listen to old Cheech and Chong records. That is not how you discover identity. You don't get it through a popular medium. You get it by being set apart. And this is what Jephthah discovered. Is that when he got apart, he was able to find out who he was. We get our identity... From, from being apart, st standing apart. Also, another powerful thing happened while he was standing apart. This is, this is one of my favorites because it's so true, is that he drew men to himself. Men love people that can stand up. Now it says in, in, that in, um, in this text that uh, verse 3, a group of Adventurers, I read in the NIV. The King James says vain men. The New King James says worthless men. The word literally means empty men. So if you want to put all those together, a man with no net worth. That's the fellowship. First Samuel 22, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down with him. Verse 2, all those who were in distress or in debt, or discontented, gathered around him, and he became their leader. This is a powerful dynamic of somebody that stands apart from pop culture. You know, one of the things that grates most real men is a man that likes Ricky Martin. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know about that. Personally, I'm very worried about Ricky. Even though he is a Hispanic, man, I gotta say that. Because there are certain elements in pop culture that we know instinctively, you know, are, are, are rubbish. And to see a guy actually stand up to it is extremely refreshing and exhilarating. Jephthah took a stand and all of a sudden, Jephthah became a rallying point for men. That, that speaks volumes on what kind of church we, we're going we're to produce. You can uh, try to comfort every... Uh, you can try to promote every issue of, of the female agenda, or you can take a stand. You know, women, women are the origin of churches, folks. That's my experience. I'd say by and large are, and that's somehow God has ordained it that way. Je the women follow Jesus, and the men caught on a little while later. The point is, though, that sometimes they carry sympathies that men have to stand up to. Saying, you know... I'll, I'll move on here. You gain men when you take a stand with popular culture. Um, James Garfield, 20th President of the United States, had been a general. He made this statement. He said, if there's one thing upon earth that man loves and admires better than another, it is a brave man, a man who dares look the devil in the face and tell him he's the devil. Isn't that true? I mean, whether or not we have a spine that is beside the point. The point is, we get a charge out of observing a man rise up and take a stand. We may in a million years never want to pay the same price, but it still gets you down deep. This is why men like Rambo. Very simple. The guy is loaded with about 15 weapons and he's killing enemies and as he kills them, he's making snide remarks and cracks, telling the devil he's the devil and it, it doesn't matter if the guy, is, you know, is an overweight dude sitting on a lazy boy, he finds himself in Rambo. I'm not, I never, you know, I never really cared much about that, but you know, 
what about Dirty Harry? A man with a 44 Magnum or whatever it was, standing up saying, go ahead, punk, make my day. It's hard to resist that. It's hard not to get into that. It's not hard to say, that is cool. That, you know what I mean? It, it grips you because it grabs you right in the center of what the essence of what manhood is. He stood up. Men also identify with the struggle. We like to see people struggle, man. Why do you think we watch, you know, 12 round fights? You know, because it's the brutal, it's the battle. And, you know, as uh, um, Jephthah struggled with his family and calling and his purpose and his legitimacy, you know, popular culture says, oh, we don't want to talk about him. But I want you to know something real men say, whoa, this is a good one. This guy is toe to toe. He's, he, he, you know what I mean? He's eye to eye with his adversary and men respect somebody that knows how to fight. I want you to know, ladies, this might blow your mind, but up to the age of 11 or 12, you actually rate your fellow, uh, um, your fellow guy by how he can fight. Isn't that terrible? But it's true. You know, you're sitting around, the, I think I can take him. No, I don't think I can take him. And every, it's a pecking order of who knows how to fight. And, and, and one of the most terrible developments of our day and hour is that young boys no longer are able to defend themselves in school. I'm not talking about bullies. But you know, some of the ridiculous things they do today, kid wants to defend himself, he's got time out and all this ridiculous stuff, friend. Back in the day, you had to get your butt kicked sometimes. <laughs> Stripes are meant for the backs of fools. My personal opinion, you don't have to agree with me, is that one of the reasons we have so much violence today is because we do not allow corporal violence anymore. Starting with spanking the child all the way to defending yourself. And I'm talking about in children. Talk to your pastor. <laughs> used to be part of culture that you had to, to be a man, you had to prove something. We like people that have to prove something. You know, that, that's been part of a, a society throughout the uh, ages. It's called the rites of passage or the rite of passage. In order to become a man, you had to prove something. There was a little uh, a public service announcement on a bus in San Francisco that had a, one little boy about to cold cock another little boy and the caption said you have nothing to prove why well, I, I take issue with that my dad's from the old school man I'm not saying I was a good fighter but I'll tell you that's not what I'm saying at all but we used to fight as brothers I have four brothers and I'm second to the youngest and so consequently you know you get your butt kicked a lot when you grow up and we'd have to run to my dad or mom you know you know, Herbie's beating on me or whatever we'd have to say. And my dad got tired of it and he bought us boxing gloves. And whenever we got into a fight, at least for this period of time when he was inspired to incorporate this, we had to box one full minute before we could quit fighting. And how many know, it, keeping your dukes up for a minute, can, you can get kind of tired. It's not like in the movies. Because, you know, my dad was from the old school. He said, you know, the only way you younger ones are going to learn how to function in life is you're going to have to learn how to fight a little bit. I was reading Roots a while back, the, the, the book they made into a movie. I thought this was, I'm going to pass this on. I really thought this was pretty deep. Back in the village, uh, Kunta Kinte's village, I remember Kunta Kinte, back in Jafure in West Africa, they had what they called manhood training. They would go and get these boys 12 or 13 years old. They'd literally kidnap them from the village and drag them out into the wilderness for a year. And they had, it's kind of like boot camp. They'd have DIs. They're called Kategos. And these guys would drill these dudes every single day for a year. And to graduate from the program, you had to find your way back to camp. Or get eaten by a lion, you know what I mean? One or the other. And this is the narrative of Kunta. He said... Even the little boys, I want you to hear this. He said, knew what would happen to anyone who showed himself too weak or cowardly to endure the training that turned boys into hunters, into warriors, into men. Suppose he should fail? 
He began gulping down his fear, remembering how he had been told that any boy who failed the manhood training would be treated as a child the rest of his life. Can I tell you something? An effeminate man is not a, a, a man trapped in a, a woman, rather, trapped in a man's body. It is a boy trapped in a man's body. But he went on to say this. He said he'd be treated like a child the rest of his life. Even though he might look like a grown man, he would be avoided and his village would never permit him to marry lest he father others like himself. Because proving yourself was an issue. And as people, as these warriors, these adventurers, these uh, worthless guys saw Jephthah taking a stand and, and, and going through this horrible assault, there was something about that stand that motivated their heart. There is a reason why in our fellowship we've taken so much junk, but there's a reason why we have such a high testosterone level in our ministry. It's because we see Pastor Mitchell taking assaults right and left. And if you have, you know, there's something about the fight that says, whoa. That's interesting. And you know what it does? It inspires other men to fight. Now, I know sometimes we have a problem with male bravado, you know? And I'm not justifying everything that's ever said across the board, but where you have high levels of testosterone from time to time, there's going to be some spillage. You know what I mean? That just kind of comes over the side. But he was powerfully used by God. The promise keeper dilemma beside the political compromises is that they fill stadiums full of men who show up just because it's a football stadium. I would even, I probably would even have gone and had the opportunity just because it's in a football stadium and a football coach is talking. I'm thinking pretty, that's pretty cool. But after people show up to the football stadium and hear the coach talk, and hear the, you know, the, the NFL athlete talk, and so forth and so on, then they have to go back to their churches that are pastored by eunuchs that preach with the forceful, forcefulness of an NPR correspondent. And because of that, that particular ministry is always going to be marginalized by that alone. Because you got to go to a church where someone can fight. Now, when he took a stand, God taught him. What happened was, they thought they were getting rid of Jephthah, but when he had to stand up to their attitudes towards him, to their assault upon him, you know what happened to Jephthah? Inadvertently, he became a mighty warrior. Which I want to close with one other point here. And that is not only did he withstand the illegitimacy assault, not only did he stand apart from the popular opinion, but he stood as a mighty warrior when it mattered the most. This is what inspired me when I read this. And that is this. The time is coming when people are going to need real men of God. The problem with our fellowship, if I can get away with using that phrase, is that we are not a very popular peacetime army. Would you concur this morning? We're not a popular peacetime force. We're more akin to the guys that would go into the bars and break tears over each other's backs until you had to go out again. But a time is coming and is upon us as we enter this new millennium where things are going to change in this nation drastically. And I believe that people are going to desperately seek out men of God that can fight the devil. Men that are not afraid to look the devil in the eye and tell him he's the devil. Right now, it was not appreciated. Back at home, the people did not want Jephthah. They did not need Jephthah. They had the wonderful worship program. They had the beautiful cathedrals. Why do you need a Jephthah in that environment? But like I said in the beginning, we live in an imperfect world, and you need warriors in an imperfect world. And eventually, things are going to change. 
God spoke to my heart powerfully as I live in San Francisco. And it's kind of like seeing the, what's coming over the hill. You can see what's happening. Uh, the Chinese have threatened uh, more than three times in the last year that they have the nuclear capability to take out Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Let me tell you something, folks. They are not worried about a nuclear exchange. They kill their own people by the, by the score. Do you think they'll be bothered if we kill some? We're just going to be the exterminator. Things are going to change. Things will get more desperate. And the men of God that learn the lesson, that learn to stand, and that do not lose heart are going to be sought out by desperate people. Let me read you a scripture here. It says in, um, in Isaiah chapter 4, And in that day, seven women will take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name, take away our reproach. I think I found the remedy to lesbianism right there. You want to know what it is? It's called war. It's called judgment. It said, in that day, all of a sudden, that independent feminist attitude was quickly discarded because all the dynamics change, friends. And when things begin to happen in our nation in this century and all the things that you think are are no longer that way and people are unstable and economies crash, people are going to take hold of a man of God. And this is what was happening with Jephthah. They were fine, weren't they? But when the Ammonites began to come over the hill, we need Jephthah now. And you know, they had, a, they had a very wonderful exchange. Jephthah said, hey, you hated me. What's the problem? They said, nevertheless. In other words, they didn't say, we still hate you. But nevertheless, <laughs> fight for us. We need somebody who knows how to fight. And we put it this way, in the, when the bombs start dropping, large marge won't suffice anymore. She might look like a man. She might wear a bunch of keys on her belt. But I'm telling you something. When push comes to shove, everything's going to be different. And those that are real men are going to rise to the surface. I believe with all my heart that this fellowship has an, an inheritance through Pastor Mitchell's stands. That's what got me. It wasn't the popularity of the stands sometimes, but it was the fact that I became convinced of the inheritance that if I followed that path, I could be a man of God and not a religious weenie. And that ought to be every one of our, great, every one of our greatest fears right there. I want to just close with one thought here, in addition to his stand, right, as he st stood as a mighty warrior, is that Jephthah had to see the bigger picture. I'm going to make a little challenge to us here as I conclude. That bigger picture was that Jephthah had to see past his conflict with his brethren. I didn't say he had to go kissing up to them. I didn't say he had to run back to the palace. Nothing of the sort. They came to him. But he had to see past it because when they approached him, he was very negative. He almost gave them the one-finger salute. <laughs> say, wait a minute. Aren't you guys on the, um, the church... Uh, um, uh, you know, a uh, community council that has condemned us? Weren't you the same people that said we were cult? And so his, his visceral response to this was, forget you guys, I don't need you. I'm here, Gilead's there, let's just leave it at that. But God began to reveal to him that he had a greater purpose than simply what he was doing. We have no obligation to the church world. That's just a silly pop scene. But friend, you and I have a long-standing obligation, 2,000-year-old obligation to the church of Jesus Christ. And apart from the church of Jesus Christ, nothing lives. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches and without me you can do nothing. And Jephthah saw this. This was not something he had to initiate. It, it, simply that at the right time, he was vindicated before their eyes because he was a guy who could cut the mustard. That's what God is doing in our midst. You're out there pioneering. You, you know, you got the little building. I, 
I got the little building. I'm out there pioneering. And we're, we're contending for, for all. And it, we seem so igni- insignificant. We seem like so unpopular. You know, like you almost want to tell somebody, the big church is like down the street. I'm, God is doing something. He's putting metal into men that right now may seem totally insignificant. But things are going to change, I guarantee you, and they will come over the hill. Jephthah had to see who, who the real enemy was. The enemy was not Gilead, his brethren. The enemy was the Ammonites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Gerbilites. They live in San Francisco. Those people are coming over the hill, folks. And I just want to add to that. Don't be a cheap shot artist when it comes to other churches. And I'll give you three quick reasons why. Number one, God loves his church no matter how screwed up. Read about it. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Six of those churches had serious problems. And God has a commitment to the church that goes way beyond our understanding at times. Number two, there are going to be times when you're going to have to judge a false spirit. Like we have had to do recently. And you are going to need the credibility with your congregation to do that. And if every time you're lacking an illustration, you take a shot at the church across town, when you do have to deal with something very real, you are going to be the boy that cried wolf. They're going to say, oh, Pastor, he's always, you know, he's always saying stuff. And third of all, exactly what I'm saying here, people are going to look for a warrior. And if you put it, you keep putting down the church, the church, if you put it down, you're going to marginalize your ministry where people are not going to trust you in that great time of need. doesn't mean you have to kiss up or give in. I just said all that. You didn't have to. But, but at the same time, Jephthah had to see that he had a much greater obligation than simply to his own hurt feelings. Joseph made this statement. Or, ra- or rather, it, Joseph, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You can be hurt and offended, and I believe God has driven us outward so he can create mighty warriors for God. God bless you.